When Morpheus holds up the battery in the Matrix and he says, we are the source of energy. I finally understand what you mean. When the guys made the Matrix, they knew exactly what they were talking about. Wherever they got their information from is very, very interesting. Once you realize what's going on, we go, oh my God, we are so bloody dumb. The manipulated history that we find seems to be created and recreated for us on an ongoing basis. And this is what's becoming a little disturbing, but at the same time, not surprising what's going on here. There are places that we don't know about that we should know about, like the Towers of Bologna in Italy. This is a drawing from the 1700s. How many of you have seen the Towers of Bologna that until 200 years ago, the city of Bologna had more than 200 towers, up to 50 meters tall. They're all gone. And then suddenly you start stumbling upon an empire that until the late 1800s was a well-known empire across the world. You look at the old maps and you see the Tartarian Empire, one of the most important global empires, and then suddenly gone. We hear nothing about Tartary and the Tartarian Empire and what happened to them. And you start seeing that, that history is literally changing right under our eyes. Recent history, it's like just being wiped out. We know nothing about it. It is weird, people. Things are getting really freaky and very, very weird. And you know, you see evidence of these things all over the place. You see very large buildings uh, that, you know, with the, the two or three bottom floors are just completely covered in mud. And then they just leave them like that and they create the entrance on the higher floors to that same building. The reason I'm bringing this up is that if the news that we have coming from the, the media uh, is fake, imagine how wrong all of our history is. And all of this, the fake news and this potentially fake history is just adding to the great human puzzle and, and making us even more confused about who we are, where we come from and why we're here. You know, institutions keep telling us that the ancients were primitive. And they looked something like this. And uh, they built countless megalithic structures with their very primitive tools, like we can build them today. And uh, they left behind these incredible places from times that we cannot remember. And we have no idea when these things actually happened. Some of them we speculate and we're probably very wrong. And they dragged large blocks up mountains and built platforms because they had nothing better to do. They got together and built giant things like this because they needed to bury some guy. And you go to Ma Mount Sharia in Siberia and that's just ridiculous. I mean, look at the size of these blocks and these structures in Siberia. Realize that wherever you go in the world, there are mysterious ancient civilizations that weird things. And we really don't know much about the motive we recognize what they've done. We're surprised by what they've done. Carving entire cities out of bedrock like this, platforms like this, and underground structures like this that are covered in Egypt just to hide it. And Borobudur, uh, which is just obviously such a powerful, resonating thing. Anyone that knows anything about sound and resonance takes one look at this and go, okay, I know exactly what they're doing here. What's interesting, as you may have noticed, many of these places, if not all of them that you've just seen, and there are countless more, all of them seem to be in the Northern Hemisphere. And that is a huge mystery. But unfortunately, the discovery of the ancient ruins of Southern Africa has just now completely blown that apart. Because now that is no longer the case. And the attention has shifted to the ancient ruins of South Africa and Southern Africa. The stone circles of Southern Africa have become one of the most interesting, mysterious and unbelievable discoveries of ancient archaeology, ancient civilizations, not just because they are so amazing to look at and remarkable, but because they opened a door and they gave us very important uh, clues as to what the ancient civilizations are doing and what technology they use. And that's actually been the big breakthrough in the, to get to a deeper understanding of what, how smart and advanced the ancient civilizations were. Uh, and when you start noticing these flower-shaped structures, that's when it gets really interesting. Notice that these are not standalone structures. They're all connected by these channels that connect them thousands of miles of channels, like they look like wires that connect all stone circles together. And then you can see that weird spider's web effect around it. Uh, no stone circle stands alone. They're all connected in this very large grid. And basically what you're looking at here is what has now been identified or recognized as the largest cluster of stone ruins anywhere on Earth. How many are there? More than 10 million. 
of these structures throughout South Africa and Zimbabwe. It is quite staggering. 10 million is not a small number. This is an insanely huge number. When we get to the reason why they did this, I think this is when it starts to get really interesting. Important thing, no doors and entrances. There are several archaeological drawings that clearly show us no doors and entrances clustered together like grapes. The channels connecting them all together like I've showed you. All Everything is connected. What kind of stones are we dealing with here? And this is where it all starts to point us in a very interesting direction. It's a special kind of stone known as Hornfels. It's a black stone. It looks like this. It's black on the inside. And then on the outside, it's got this reddish brown skin that grows very, very slowly. A few thousand years per microscopic layer. That's how long it takes for this patina to grow. So if you've got tools or artifacts made out of this black rock, and the tools and artifacts are covered in patina, then you have to assume or conclude that the tools and artifacts were made a long, long time ago. Not just a few hundred or a few thousand years ago. Because that's not how the patina grows. So the patina in this is a very important way for us to not evaluate exactly or date the stones, the tools, but to give us an idea of how old they are. And we know that based on that, they're very, very old. The other important thing is that the stones ring like bells. And it was really at the moment that I discovered that these stones have acoustic properties and they ring like bells that everything changed. I no longer looked at the stone circles as cattle kraal or dwellings. I suddenly realized that we're dealing with sound. Sound, the primordial source of all things. Infinite energy, what Nikola Tesla probably used. Sound that levitates. And now we've got sound coming out of the stone walls of the stone circles. That's a great breakthrough. But what are we dealing with here? What are the stones made of? They're made of silica, people. Silica. Most of the content of these stones, what are they made of? 90% of most of the stone on this planet is made of silica. Sandstone is virtually pure silica. So here we have advanced technology used in ancient sites. The most advanced technology today is all silicon-based technology. Silica has memory. It contains knowledge. It contains information. It conducts sound and light. It stores light and sound and information and stores energy. In Southampton University, they're experimenting now with tiny little crystals that store up to 350 terabytes of information. One tiny little thing. But I can tell you that crystals like that will actually store infinite amount of information. The other important thing is that these structures are not just memory banks, they're actually giant machines. Giant machines that are activated by light and by sound. So where's the flagship in South Africa? Africa among these ruins, no doubt it's Adam's calendar. The patina growth tells us how old some of these ruins are. You can see this here, this had a tip there that broke off. There's two millimeters of patina growth there. This tells us that even the stone ruins, not just Adam's calendar, is extremely old. For this amount of patina to grow on a break that looks like that, it will take hundreds of thousands of years, not just a few thousand years. Well, the ancients used sacred geometry for everything. We now know this. So, I drew a golden mean spiral from Adam's calendar and guess where it ends? Right between the pyramids. Adam's calendar. And you realize that the argument of probability can be used here. What is the probability that this is an accident? It's several million to one, so it must be connected. And that there's a reason why these are here in that distance exactly from Adam's calendar. The other interesting thing is that when you connect Adam's calendar to Great Zimbabwe, uh, it ends right in the Great Pyramid of Giza, all along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. What were these stone circles for? I think you start seeing what these patterns are all about. This is the cymatic pattern for the shape of the sound ah, on a metal plate. will make this beautiful sound. And you realize that each one of these stone circles is just a cymatic pattern of the sound of planet Earth at that specific point. This is a representation of the sound frequency right there. So each one of these is a plug point, an energetic plug point into Mother Earth, becoming an energy generating source and multiplying that frequency and that energy. How much does it multiply it? I have to take you, first explain to you this little device here in modern electronics known as a magnetron. These magnetrons are in laser beams like this little laser beam here. Some, some of these are benign, they don't hurt you, and some laser beams can cut 
metal in a split second. This is how powerful magnetrons are. Imagine if a little magnetron can create so much energy. How much a magnetron 20 meters in diameter will create made of virtually pure silica. An insane amount of energy. There are thousands of these magnetrons in southern Africa. Thousands. So now you can start imagining how much energy they were creating and a huge energy grid that covered large parts of southern Africa. And the interesting thing is that this energy grid is still alive. It still gives us insane amounts of energy because we've measured it. We've measured electromagnetic waves, the sound frequencies that come out of them, the loudness of these sound frequencies, and also this thing called heat signature. The heat signature is the average temperature of 200 meters below the ground. The heat signature tells us that at 80 degrees, if you measured the heat signature 80 degrees, it'll tell you that you're standing on top of a volcano. So just keep that in mind. Then we got to Adam's calendar. As you enter, this is the circle that you see from space. As you walk into this imaginary circle, the heat signature is nine and a half degrees. As you walk into that circle, there's no circle. It's an imaginary circle. It shoots to 77 degrees. It's like literally nine and a half degrees, 77 degrees. What the hell is going on? Something strange is going on that we don't understand. Between these two calendar stones, it goes up to beyond 80 degrees. Now the measurement is telling you that you're standing on top of a volcano. And yet, we just it's just bedrock, it's just sandstone. And then we measured the um, sound frequencies, nothing, just ambient noise. As you go through this imaginary circle, it goes beyond 375 gigahertz of sound that we're measuring. As far as I know, this kind of sound frequencies have never ever been measured anywhere on planet Earth that we know of. That brings me to the Earth grid, because it seems that all these ancient sites on Earth, Adam's Calendar, the Great Pyramids, Pumapunku, etc., they all seem to be built on these nodal points, these energy points that have this. Look, there's Adam's Calendar right there. There's Giza. And this is really interesting, because there seems to be some sort of an energetic code encoded into planet Earth that's mirrored from the sky. And why do we know it's mirrored from the sky? Because the Sumerian texts tell us. And this is not a Zechariah Sitchin translation, by the way. This comes from the Shoyan collection. And this is what it says. In the distant days, in those days after destinies had been decreed, after An, who was Anu, and Enlil, his son, had set up the regulations for heaven and earth. That's interesting. Regulations for heaven and earth. Enki, the exalted knowing God, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up the cities. So they're suggesting that there's a grid of energetic rules in the sky that is mirrored on earth, and they set up the cities on earth, mimicking or mirroring this energy grid in the sky. So this points us David Wilcock first actually discovered this when he started talking about these military emblems and these bands that are encoded. This information is encoded into these emblems. They call it the rules. Remember? The rules. The fixed rules for heaven and earth. And here we have the military calls these bands around the earth the rules. They don't know where they come from, but they've always been there. Some sort of an energetic grid around planet Earth. Well, this is deeply encoded stuff, people. So the fixed rules, the energy grid around the Earth is actually encoded in the modern military emblems. All of them. And we now know that all these ancient sites are just giant machines. The stone circles are the, the trigger point to make us realize that all these ancient structures were just giant machines built to generate energy. For what? That remains the mystery. We know that these are machines because sometimes photographs like this show us that energy is still coming out of these giant machines. Stonehenge, very obvious uh, energy device. And then these ancient, these ancient sites in Egypt are just technology on a gigantic scale. Uh, the obelisk rings like a bell and you realize it's an antenna. And when you start looking at these structures in Egypt, you realize too many pillars, not enough space. This is not for praying and offering food and going to pray to the gods and all that nonsense. This is all just giant technology. There you've got a beautiful amplification chamber with ringing pillars in front of it on a pedestal and you realize that these are just templates for giant circuit boards and these guys are just building these energy devices on a scale that we can't do today because we don't have enough money and we have no idea how to do it. And they were doing things that we can't even imagine today. Giant circuit boards, macro processors, and then devices like this, obviously, and uh, you realize that we're dealing with 
a time in human history that was very, very different from our lives today. And when you go to, to um, South America, Saksai Huaman, it's just another circuit board uh, on top of a mountain. Um, there's another look at it. Borobudur, Indonesia, just you know, amplifying sound frequencies, shooting it up into the sky uh, with a central beam at the top. And this all takes us to Sazer technology. Sazer technology that was only introduced to humanity in 2009 as opposed to laser beams. Sazer beams, infinitely more powerful. But it seems that human sound was used to amplify and start these circuit boards. Even uh, the Parthenon in Greece, that was an ancient circuit board. It's really badly destroyed. And they had these amphitheaters, they squeeze a bunch of people in there, fill them with fear, make them clap their hands and whatever they do in all these religious sites as well. All that energy gets channeled down these, these vibrating pillars and into the circuit board and it starts the circuit board through sound. And we find these circuit board amphitheater connections all over the world. Amphitheaters, circuit boards, whatever they were doing with that energy remains a mystery. There's another amphitheater connected to a circuit board on top of the mountain there. You can see it badly destroyed. Here's another one in North Africa and Algeria. Here the circuit board is, the amphitheater is right in the heart of the ancient circuit board. And this doesn't stop there. The secret sound activation continues in medieval times and continues in modern times. Temples have just become churches. And you will see the importance of the structures of these churches with the conical towers, the cone-shaped tools that focus the sound into sazer beams this stuff is just so brilliant. Our sound is being harvested as energy. It's that simple. Anytime you build a circle, pyramids, obelisks or domes and cathedral towers, these are all harvesting devices for amplifying and harvesting sound and focusing sound. And this is why all cathedrals, all major churches, all major castles around the world are always built on very powerful energy lines, ley lines, very energetic places around the world. Every time there's a Catholic church cathedral, it's always on a very strategic point. And this is why the mystery of the medieval cathedrals is such an important thing to crack. Architects today just marvel at how these guys built it. With the tools they had in, in the year 1000 or whenever it was 10 something, when they built these in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, we couldn't build it today. Uh, with those kind of tools. We'd struggle to build today with modern tools. This is just spectacular. Have a look at the inside. It's so obvious what's going on here. Giant acoustic chamber with a dome on top of it, with vibrating pillars from the resonance of the people clapping their hands or the fear or shouting or singing, whatever they were doing, going up these pillars into the dome. And what's on top of the dome outside of the cathedral are these spires <laughs> that send the frequencies up into the sky. I mean, this is just so obvious what's going on here, but it gets even better. Now you start looking at, this, at the, the extra features in these cathedrals and you realize that they're also using the shape of light that amplifies the acoustic effect inside the chamber. Can you see the shape of these, these windows? Circular, very important, not square, circular or oval, etc. And we start seeing very obvious magnetron shaped windows. And once you know and light and sound are inextricably connected, if you send light through a magnetron shape, it will create a magnetron effect. The shape of the window will take the frequency of the light and amplify it because it's in the shape of a magnetron. It's spectacular. So the light from outside goes through the magnetron structures into the, the church, into the cathedral. It amplifies it in the, because the cathedral is just an ambient chamber. And now you got this, this magnetron amplification of the light that shoots out the spires and through the, the top of the cathedral. It's like laser transfer. You can take the information of an egg from a, a salamander or a lizard. You put a laser beam through a fertilized lizard egg and you point the laser at the infertile frog egg and the frog will become a lizard. The light takes the information and deposits it from one to the other. That's what happens. The light comes in through the window, takes the information of the light and amplifies it inside the chamber. Magnetron shaped windows 
in cathedrals is suddenly a dead giveaway that this is very, very advanced technology that we're only waking up to now. Once you realize what's going on, we go, oh my God, we are so bloody dumb. We are just like literally lambs to the slaughter. We're just being lied to, abused, eaten, slaughtered, tortured. This is a, a woman by the name of Annie in Sweden. I took this picture of a church. Look at that beautiful Taurus. Look at the energy coming out of that, creating a Taurus effect. As every now and then it just shows itself to us very obviously. And we suddenly realize that city grids and cities are just the modern day circuit boards generating huge amounts of sound. Human beings never stop making a noise. Cities are constantly noisy. They keep pushing up sound into the sky through the high skyscrapers. We are sources of energy because we never stop freaking making a noise. And suddenly, when Morpheus Change. holds up the battery in the Matrix and he says, we are the source Into of energy, this. you go, I get it, dude. I finally understand what you mean. When the guys made the Matrix, they knew exactly what they were talking about. Wherever they got the information from is very, very interesting. And that brings me back to places like Bologna. These hundreds of towers that have now been destroyed, gone. This is a very, very early picture of Bologna with many of the towers that have already been gone. But look at the early image, the drawing from 1700s of Bologna. There's a dome over the city. There's a wall and a dome over the city. What's going on here?